first, uh, with respect to the Land and Water Conservation Fund, we need to get real. Uh, we have not in this country, and I think it's been a breach of trust uh, to the American people. Um, I sat in my office uh, with Will Shafroth uh, probably two, three months ago with uh, Henry Diamond. Henry Diamond was uh, one of the people who, uh, with uh, Robert Kennedy and John Kennedy and several other people, developed the concept of the Land and Water Conservation Fund. And he said there was a very simple conversation that they had with uh, Stuart Udall in the office that I now occupy. And the concept that they had in mind was that we take from the earth, we should return some of what we take back to the earth. And so they knew we were, we were developing and we would, would be developing uh, huge resources uh, in terms of oil and gas and coal all across this country. And that as we develop those resources on our public lands, because those lands and those resources belong to you and me and everybody else, every, three, every one of the 304 million Americans, that a part of that money would be returned for a perpetual investment back into our land and water, okay? And what ended up happening is illustrative by what happened just last year. Last year, the Department of Interior through the BLM and the Minerals Management Service raised $24 billion, $24 billion that came from royalties, rentals, bonus bids that were paid, $24 billion. Now, of that amount, there was only about 242 million that went into the Land and Water Conservation Fund. So a minuscule part of that $24 billion. Now why was that so? It's because since uh, the law was signed in 1965, that money has been diverted to lots of other purposes. And so we generate $24 billion, but we end up getting only about 1% of that coming back to land and water conservation fund purposes. Now, what is the long-term view then in terms of how we move forward? First, we have started to make uh, some inroads. Uh, for the first time this year, uh, we will have uh, about $465 million, the president included in the president's budget to fund land and water conservation fund. Uh, his projections are under our budget that by 2014, we'll fully fund it at $900 million. And so that's uh, a long-term commitment to LWCF. We are also actively uh, engaged uh, with a number of uh, very important people to figure out how we are going to move forward to uh, write a uh, chapter that will frankly make even the 900 million look a little bit small. Now, so uh, there's a lot more to come on, on that agenda. Uh, your second question is why, it is why is it important to the people of Ohio? It's important to the people of Ohio because if you think about the economic interests that come with uh, having uh, opportunities uh, in our rivers, in our lakes, in our great outdoors, it's good for the economy, as I just stated in uh, the statistics that I, that, I, that, I, that I talked about. It also is very good for the health of Americans. You know, Governor O'Malley, others, Governor Strickland here have understood the nexus between uh, the, our health and what our people do in the outdoors, whether it's hiking, uh, fishing, exercising, it's a good thing to do. So a lot of benefits that, 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 that come from it, and it's going to be important to every single person who lives here in Ohio. And with respect to uh, uh, Cuyahunga and the uh, possibility of the uh, acquisition of uh, the uh, 800 acres at uh, Blossoms, we've had some conversations about that this morning. Uh, it, is a, it is the very high priority for, for the region. Uh, it is very much on Will's mind, and so uh, he will, uh, we will try to do everything we can uh, to make that happen uh, in, the, uh, in the years ahead. Let me um, just uh, reflect on one other thing based on your, on your, on your question, Bill. Yeah, I think that when uh, Teddy Roosevelt uh, spent all his time at Yellowstone and throughout this country out in the Rockies, uh, you, you can imagine, um, you know, it would probably was not as popular a thing back then as it, it might be now that he was trying to look 100 and 200 and 300 years ahead, but he did. And so today, much of the legacy that we enjoy all across this country is because he had that kind of foresight. It's that time again. It's uh, time to create another Rooseveltian uh, moonshot with what we do uh, with respect to land and water conservation. And I hope we are able to put those pieces together in, uh, in the months ahead. Um, one more question, and then I'll have a closing comment, and I'm going to go run to grab a plane. Uh, welcome to Cleveland. It's a great honor to be speaking with you. Uh, 
My name is Jacob Travis. I'm the Jacob. founder and president of a nonprofit called Solar College Initiative. The mission is to get the maximum amount of solar energy possible on every college campus. And my question is, when we talk about renewable energy and the vast resources in this country of solar and wind, we often think of these huge fields uh, that could become solar farms, wind farms. Uh, but there is potential on the rooftops of every college campus, for example, uh, Cleveland State University, others, uh, to, to have megawatts of solar. And I'm wondering, it does it fall under the purvey of the Department of the Interior to, to promote uh, that, that kind of rooftop or parking lot solar, that distributed generation, which actually preserves uh, the land from becoming you know, a, a field of, of solar panels and it actually puts the, the technology right on the rooftop where it's going to be used? It does fall under the purview of the Department of Interior. We, we have a big purview. <laughs> <laughs> It is something that we have a very uh, significant voice on because uh, the way that we're organized, uh, we, we have an energy team and so I work very closely with uh, Stephen Chu, my colleague, uh, who's the uh, Secretary of Energy and others. And so we're moving forward with a comprehensive ag agenda that's uh, cross-departmental. And what you say is true. Uh, we will be able to move uh, forward with uh, some of the large-scale projects that I spoke about earlier. And these are very, these are large scale projects. Uh, we have literally um, dozens of them which are pending in the pipeline almost ready to go. And in the southwest, it's about sun. And so the projects are ranged from 300 megawatts to 2,000 megawatts. Think about what that, how big that is in a, in a way that I think people understand it more than, uh, than gigawatts and megawatts and homes and all that stuff. Uh, 350 megawatts is about what is produced by a mid sized coal fire, fired power plant, 350 megawatts. Okay, you know how long it takes to permit a coal-fired power plant anymore? Well, many of these uh, large-scale solar projects that we have, frankly, we will be able to permit and I expect will be up and running uh, by 2011. It's going to show how it is that uh, we can really harness uh, the power of the sun. We've already d done it with wind on the offshore, on, on the onshore in many ways, uh, including uh, Texas and Iowa, which lead the way, but I, I've seen what it's done in my state of Colorado where we went from uh, zero megawatts in uh, 2004, 2005 to the point where it's more than 2,000 megawatts, equivalent of three, four, five coal fired power plants just in my state alone from, uh, from wind power. So that will happen. But your question, Jacob, is a very good one. Uh, beyond large scale uh, development and investments in uh, renewable energy projects, how can we make renewable energy uh, be a part that everybody can participate in? And so we need to do it with solar, as you say, uh, with uh, uh, the kind of uh, production that can come off the rooftops is being done dramatically in California in part because of uh, the legislature's leadership there and the governor's push for, uh, for solar energy where you have net metering concepts and uh, people uh, installing uh, solar panels which now don't look like the old solar panels, essentially just putting them on the rooftop and then the way the, the grid operates on a home, when you're taking electricity off the grid, it's charging you. If you are collecting the photons that become the electrons that go into the grid off your roof and it's going back into the grid, then your meter runs in the reverse way, so you actually get paid for it. So those are the kinds of things that uh, are on their way for, uh, for homeowners. I was in New Jersey about a month ago in Atlantic City and uh, held my first uh, major meeting on the Outer Continental Shelf and its future. And we held it at uh, the arena in Atlantic City. Uh, more than, I think it's more than 30% of the energy uh, that powers the entire convention center and arena comes from the solar panels that have been installed in, on the roof in New Jersey, in Atlantic City. And so sometimes we tend to think about the solar opportunities of the Southwest, uh, but the fact is that the sun shines in a lot of other places. And uh, maybe the sun doesn't shine for 360 days as it does in the deserts of Arizona or 350 days and the way it, it shines in uh, my native San Luis Valley. Uh, maybe it's not as intense, uh, but there are ways in which uh, the solar energy, I think, is going to be a, a very important part of our, of our future, uh, future equation. Well, I can take a few more questions. Or what's, your, what's your timing? We can take another question. That'd be great. Another question? 